I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Mark Hostetler. He is a uh, with the University of Florida Extension Program, and he's working in the areas of resource efficient communities. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Thanks, Robert. Hello, everybody out there in the online internet world. Um, to get started, I have about 40 so minutes to um, uh, do this webinar, and I'd like to cover several topics. First, I'll start out uh, in terms of what is biodiversity conservation, urban communities, and decision makers. And then I'll go through kind of to the meat of the talk and talk about conservation developments and how we can design and build and maintain such communities. And touch on a little bit about resolving post-construction issues, and then talk about a continuing education course at the end. To give a little more background about myself, I'm a wildlife biologist by training, uh, but I work with many different folks across the university, uh, regionally, nationally, and internationally. I uh, helped co-founded a group called Program for Resource Efficient Communities, and it's uh, various disciplines in there, you know, from energy to building construction, um, landscape architecture, et cetera, with the idea of saying how can all the research that's being done be translated in a way and applied in, quote, unquote, the real world. So just, to, I know people come with, in with different backgrounds. Uh, I know 35% of you are all none, so I'm not sure what your background is. But uh, just to get some definitions out there, what is biodiversity? Uh, it really depends on the person, uh, how they define it. But typically, it's defined uh, across three different uh, uh, definitions. One's habitat diversity. And a lot of people think in terms of species diversity, how many species you have in a given area. That's another way to define biodiversity. And genetic diversity, and that's in terms of looking at uh, genetics uh, within different areas and across areas. Um, the one thing I like to emphasize is that biodiversity conservation focuses on native and endemic species versus species riches. Uh, so you could have highly species rich areas that have exotics and natives in there, typically urban areas. But when we talk about conservation, biodiversity conservation, we're talking about conservation of native and endemic species. And endemic species are species that are found in a given area and nowhere else in the world. So I'll give you an example of this in Florida. It's uh, considered a biodiversity hotspot. We have over 2,800 native plants, 700 native vertebrates. Uh, in terms of endemics in Florida, we have 224 plants that are found nowhere else in the world, 14 vertebrates, and uh, 1,500 endemic invertebrates. And if we think about biodiversity, why do we why are we interested in conserving urban biodiversity? Why don't we just focus our attention on areas outside of urban areas? Well, there's several reasons. Um, I won't go through all of them in depth, but there's many social and economic benefits. These are studies out there that home prices are higher in, in areas with green infrastructure and highly biodiverse environments. Uh, it's a primary area where nowadays most people have their first interaction with local plants and animals. And in reality, urban areas impact surrounding natural ec ecosystems quite a bit. I mean, you can't uh, put stuff on the land in urban areas and not expect that it's going to stay within urban areas. You can think of invasive exotics, planting seeds that will be carried by birds outside of city boundaries. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, we have what's called the 2060 report in Florida. Um, we're expected to go from 18 million to 36 million by 2060 in 50 years. And if you look at the red areas, that expands the amount of urban areas quite a bit. And so that's uh, we really think about those green blobs now that are natural areas being surrounded by urban areas that can have quite a bit of impacts on what's going on in the natural areas. And if you look kind of at a satellite image here of, of light, uh, you can kind of see this is kind of cities may make up over 10, may only 10 to 15 percent of the land area within North America, but the impacts are quite huge. 
uh, even if you look all the light down in Florida and you can see the concentration of the uh, Chicago and heavy urban areas, um, then you look up in Canada and you see in the boreal forest there's a lot of light up there and there's actually not many big cities and you can see Edmonton and a couple other places. And so those light flares, believe it or not, are gas flares from oil exploration. So all generating all the energy that we're consuming down in the U.S. is actually impacting what we consider wilderness in the boreal forest in Canada. So just to illustrate that cities uh, operate at global scales as well. But when we think about designing urban communities, who are the decision makers? Who do we need to reach? And I'm going to go through an, a kind of a cartoon illustration. This is in the southwest in Arizona. Um, you can imagine the person on the left uh, who's decided to do turf grass in the middle of the desert. Let's say it's in Phoenix. And the person on the right decided to do more xeriscaping with soros and cacti and native plants. So you can imagine those decisions can be made by individuals, but cumulatively, if all the people within the uh, subdivision did uh, what the person did on the left with turf grass, it can have a huge impact on uh, water, energy, and biodiversity, as opposed to having all natives in a xeriscaping in terms of landscaping uh, within the neighborhood. But those homeowners, even though they make they feel like they can make any decision. They are constrained somewhat by what the developers or built environment professionals have done. So developers decided uh, how big the roads are, where the roads go, what type of landscaping to put in. So it really creates a social norm for the community. So it's really difficult for homeowner X to come in, look at turf grass, for example, across a neighborhood and decide to put in cacti. Um, sometimes there might even be covenants against this that says um, you cannot uh, tear up the turf grass in your front yard and put in natives because it says you have to have 80% turf grass. So the developers really constrain what the homeowners can do. And then, but the developers are also constrained somewhat by local policy and planning codes. And here's an example. In, in Florida, we have the comprehensive development plan. Every five to six years, each county has to produce this plan with input from the public and voted on by the elected officials. And that plan uh, regulates where development go, what's considered agricultural areas, conserved areas, et cetera. And within those plans, they typically have land development regulations that dictate how the developers could actually uh, build their subdivisions. Being a biologist, there's a connection. I wanted to just throw up this slide of, let's say, decisions made by birds for habitat and uh, human decisions. So the lower part of the figure, we have this Carolina wren. Carolina wren typically have a, a small home range, so decisions made by homeowners and developers can impact the distribution of the Carolina wren. At the top figure, you have red-tailed hawk. They have a much larger home range, and those decisions uh, to locate, the bird's decisions, if I might use that uh, term, uh, when they are looking to set up their home range, it's really at a much larger scale. So it's a combination of city planner decisions and developer decisions that impact uh, the distribution of red-tailed hawk. This slide is just to illustrate that there is connections between uh, decisions made by humans and, and habitat selection decisions by wildlife, it's just that it's a matter of scale. And the reason why I throw that up there, and it also can be quite complicated in terms of what is considered habitat, and I'll throw up this example of how forest fragments within urban areas can serve as stopover sites for migrants, and migrants are these long distance and short distance um, migrating birds, it's the neotropical warblers that migrate from South America all the way up to uh, upper parts of Canada. And along the way, they can't make that trip without stopping to rest, to find shelter and food. And even the interior forest specialists that breed in large patches in uh, northern part of the U.S. and Canada, those species may, have, not, may not be able to breed in forest fragments, but they certainly do use these fragments as stopover sites. So this is, this is just to illustrate there is many different uses for habitat within urban areas. Here's an example of that. Right now we're in migration season. Uh, here in Florida, I've just seen um, these warblers passing through. 
Uh, the orange area at the top is a breeding for the yellow warbler. The yellow area is a migration zone where the birds are passing to go to the Caribbean, Central America, and even down to South America. Um, we just un uh, worked on, my graduate student and I just worked on an online evaluation tool to address how different development de designs impact different bird species and uh, bird habitat scores. And the idea behind this is that we do have some idea for transportation, energy, walkability, but really don't have a tool that allow planners to evaluate and pick optimal designs to uh, benefit different species. And so this is our first attempt at this. Uh, if you're interested, um, I'll give you the website in a second, but it has several simple steps. Uh, even though we, we got a lot of feedback, we went to a menu system instead of a GIS-based system because sometimes those are difficult to navigate. Uh, but this is a very simple uh, five-step uh, calculation. And that is the website there. Uh, if you're interested, uh, we are just testing it out. Uh, please feel free to use this tool. You can use it and you can put in multiple scenarios and it'll give you uh, different scores depending on how much uh, forest patches you can serve and how much tree canopy you can serve in um, built areas. So check, please check that out. And do if you do use it, just email us and give us some feedback because we're trying to make this idea of urban design and management and biodiversity transparent for practitioners, uh, planners, developers, general public uh, in a way that they can actually say, oh, okay, this is a fairly decent design for this group of species, but not a good design for this other group of species. So in all, when you think about these, dis these decision makers, you have the policy makers constraining um, Developers, developers constrain what citizens and homeowners do, but there's the feedback loops, of course. Of course, developers can <laughs> pressure uh, policymakers into changing uh, policies. Uh, citizens and homeowners can actually, through their purchasing power, uh, influence what developers build. And there's also through the voting, through voting in elections, uh, citizens and homeowners can impact what type of policymakers are in within an area. So if the goal is to conserve urban biodiversity and to minimize impacts, um, then we need more developments that incorporate green infrastructure into their design and green practices, in, uh, <laughs> more green infrastructure, sorry, there's a repeat there, uh, into their management plans. So to reiterate, if we're doing uh, some of the terms out there that we hear is conservation development, neo-traditional design, uh, green development, sustainable development, um, if we're going to do biodiversity, uh, incorporate in this is these goals of one, to conserve uh, natural resources on site and also to minimize impact on surrounding areas. But to do this, it's not simple. It's pretty complex. In fact, there's three phases if you think about any development. You have site design, you know, where you put the roads, the built areas, the green infrastructure. Here in this example, we have a wildlife corridor um, that's going through the development. But once you have a good design, um, I feel that the next two phases are probably the most critical. That is construction, people coming onto the site and building uh, what the original intent was, and then Lastly, post-construction phase. Now, you, if you've done the site design and construction well, then you've got to worry about all the people that move into these areas and how they manage their homes, yards, and neighborhoods impacts the functionality of, of the development. What are some of the site design issues? Well, there's many. I just threw up a couple. I mean, you can have a bad design. You can be highly fragmented. You can put roads in impede wildlife movement. You can um, not think about in terms of how much impervious surfaces you produce or build on the site. But construction has a whole range of issues. I mean, I don't know if, uh, if you've been on a construction site, but there is some rules and regulations. You've seen the silt fences, for example, that are built to contain contaminants. But how many of you have been on a construction site or seen a construction site where those silt fences have been maintained properly over the, over the life of the construction project? Uh, very rare to see that. Um, improper use of earthwork machines is huge in terms of uh, long-term effects on both natural areas nearby and areas within the built 
uh, environment that has been designed to conserve biodiversity. I'll give you just a couple examples of this. One is thinking uh, in Florida and elsewhere, um, it's hot out. So earthwork machines are typically um, parked underneath uh, trees and buffer areas. So this is an example of, 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 of a buffer that's been conserved uh, to protect areas on the back end there. But if you park heavy vehicles, earthwork machines within the buffer are under trees, it compacts the soil and almost turns it into concrete and it destroys the root zone so those trees will eventually die over time. And there's also post-construction issues. So once uh, people move into an area and you have a nice green infrastructure, you have natives in the landscape, you have uh, forest fragments conserved, well, people can, quote, unquote, run amok. I mean, you can have all-terrain vehicles that uh, uh, move into the preserved areas. There's lots of research showing that this does happen. Uh, you can have improper management of stormwater systems, pesticide use, feeding wildlife. Uh, we have issues here in Florida about feeding alligators and bears and raccoons. I won't go into the details of that, but it can cause quite a bit of human-wildlife conflicts. And we, even pet issues, releasing pets into the environment. And we have a huge Burmese python issue in the Everglades as a result of the nearby cities that raise Burmese pythons but release them into the Everglades. <laughs> That's just an example of, um, I'm from Indiana originally, and I came down here and people would feed marshmallows to alligators. Why marshmallows? Well, you know, they're cheap, they float, gators like them. And you, and if you ever visit Florida or you live in Florida, uh, you can tell that an alligator has been fed if you come up to the edge of a bank and you see an alligator and it moves towards you. It's not looking at you as prey, it's looking for a handout. Alligators that have not been fed will naturally move away from humans. So what do we need? We need trained and motivated developers, architects, and environmental con uh, consultants. We need trained and motivated contractors, contractors, civil engineers, landscaping companies for, to help implement sustainable construction. But we really need, and also, which is very um, not often addressed when we talk about green or conservation development is educated, motivating homeowners. And I'm going to talk a little bit more how we can address this. This came through uh, a number of smart growth types of uh, conversations I had with um, planners and um, architects and developers and I said, well, what are these green communities? Are the residents that move into these green communities actually environmentally um, you have more uh, better attitudes towards environment and, and implement better practices. And so we did a couple studies, and the take-home message from the studies was that across the board, most homeowners score low in terms of environmental attitudes, knowledge, or behaviors, but there's really no difference between conventional and green developments. Um, many homeowners don't have the appropriate information on how to manage their homes, yards, and neighborhoods. And the sale office information is not adequate. People often forget the information. Even there's a huge you know, front to make this, say this is a green community you're buying into. However, homeowners, they're not evil. They just, and they desire to, uh, to have local environmental information and ways to minimize their impacts. So uh, just to, I uh, don't have time to talk about all the research, um, a lot of the conservation developments that have been studied and anecdot anecdotally have failed over the years, mainly uh, through a variety of reasons, but particularly because even though there's good green infrastructure within a conservation develop development, like a natural open space or a good wetland, they tend to erode over time due to activities by nearby homeowners. You can think of feral cat colonies, invasive exotics, ATV vehicles, uh, improper fertilization that runs off the lawns and uh, turf grass and goes into the wetlands. And I just said that, but the real thing is that management is lacking. There's no management for the natural areas that have been conserved, and there's no management that addresses environmental concerns or biodiversity concerns within the neighborhoods themselves. 
One solution, well, we've tried this uh, one way to engage with the uh, local residents is to install a neighborhood educational program. These are dyna dynamic signs that are placed throughout the community with the idea that it, it um, um, gives information about a natural resource topic. And the one down in the lower right is talking about um, uh, prescribed fire. It's really hard to do prescribed fire in a natural area near neighborhoods unless, the, unless the, the homeowners are on board with it because it creates a lot of smoke. But in the long term, it not only benefits the ecosystem, but protects their homes from having large fires that come in and um, um, skip across their landscapes into their homes. Um, so how do we reach a typical homeowner? This is an example of a colleague of mine in his backyard with a pool, et cetera, in their barbecue, in their lawn. You know, uh, how do we reach people that move into neighborhoods? And, and um, we use this educational sign program connected to a website and also covenants in a brochure for homeowners that address environmental information. If you're an example of it, if you're uh, interested in this, um, uh, there's a website. Uh, it talks, it goes through several green community examples. One's Madeira, and the other one's Harmony in Florida. Um, that website talks about various natural resource issues. You look to, towards the bottom, you can see about using water wisely, managing household waste, energy efficient living, et cetera. And the idea is that even though the home might be energy efficient or the turf or the landscape might be energy efficient in terms of using native, very little irrigation, et cetera, it really takes the homeowner to maintain that over time. And you need to put that information that's easily accessible and um, relevant to them in terms of addresses things in their own neighborhood. And we did a longitudinal study. We compared a couple of uh, developments that had this education program and um, to a, another community nearby that did not have the education program and had some positive results. The uh, homeowners within um, the program with the educational uh, kiosk, uh, they had increased capability to apply environmental practices. Uh, they improve environmental attitudes, knowledge, and behaviors. And most residents use the dynamic sign. So if you had to put your money somewhere, the website and the brochure and the covenants, they really didn't pay too much, too much attention to them, although I would argue the covenants provide the backbone for the community. But most residents, residents use these uh, dynamic signs. So how can governments support conservation development initiatives that actually conserve uh, biodiversity? I'm going to go and uh, and talk a little bit about this, but I think the main thing that's really left out of the equation, and I kind of hinted towards this earlier, is that if you think about those three phases, design, construction, and post-construction, policy, 95% of our policy addresses design. Hardly anything addresses construction, and very little with teeth, mind you, you know, actually with teeth, not just uh, some verbiage, but verbiage that has fines behind it um, that addresses construction techniques and post-construction techniques in terms of conservation developments. So how could we start something uh, in that, you know, think about your own locality. How would you get a unique uh, conservation development that um, has many unique and novel features, like low impact development. They have rain gardens and swales and native plants and a lower footprint in terms of the homes, uh, natural areas, very little impervious surface. It's hard to get things started when there's no uh, conventional practices that have been in the area for 40, 50 years. Um, and to, and to uh, to reward novel practices, such as like environmental uh, covenants, codes, and restrictions, management plans with funding behind them, signage in the neighborhood, um, you need uh, some type of uh, carrot. You could do it by a stick and do a regu regulatory type of policy right away, but that's difficult to pass. Perhaps a way to do it is uh, like density bonuses, some f a financial gain for the developer who adopts these new practices, such as having environmental CCNRs or native landscaping. And so that they don't have to do it, but if they do do it, they get more units 
per acre, and that's an actual financial advantage for that developer to do a novel uh, practice. Uh, I'm, a student and I look at incentive-based policies. I just talked about that uh, across Florida and elsewhere, and we found out that most of them failed. <laughs> and when I say failed, that very few developers um, uh, take uh, these new incentives. A lot of time is spent developing the incentives, but we found the ones that were successful had three ingredients. One, uh, they were developed with stakeholder input. Um, it's not enough to have city or county officials in the back room developing this through uh, their own ideas or through uh, research that's been out there. Uh, it's really you need the actual those people that will be affected by the incentive-based policy be in the room discussing what is truly an incentive to them. In one area might be density bonuses. Another area might be fast-tracking permits or permit breaks. Then you have to have a good marketing education campaign. A lot of times we found that these incentive-based policies just sit on the books, on a shelf somewhere. No one takes advantage of them. And the third is you've got to have good built government capacity. In other words, all the departments uh, are aware of, and that's key, and support an incentive. For example, you might have a low-impact development incentive where you uh, reward people that do rain gardens or enhance stormwater basins, impervious surface, or pervious surfaces, et cetera. But then the engineers might see this and not aware of this and say, well, how are we supposed to give them credit for this? We, we don't have that in our regulations anywhere. They may actually uh, slow the process down um, because they won't uh, give credit towards pervious surface uh, and um, uh, different types of rain gardens and swales that can help with stormwater issues, for example. So you got to have those three ingredients uh, in terms of county and city policy in order for uh, incentive-based policy to really take hold. But if we uh, go on, um, remember to think about those three decisions, three levels of decision makers: the planners, policy makers, developers, built environment professionals, and then the public. How can we encourage um, more developers to conserve biodiversity? I. Over the years, I'm utterly convinced we need to build a model of development in each county within the state or within a region. Because even this presentation, uh, I'm not sure, I don't think there are many developers out there in the audience right now, but it, you know, it's not, it's hard to change what you've been doing, a well-worked model of development into something new unless you see an example of it. And so if you build, if one Maverick developer and city planner and it gets together and say, let's make something different in this community, then that pay, um, pays huge dividends because now other developers can see this and other homeowners can see this oh, and say, hey, this is pretty neat not to have any turf grass and, and throughout the whole community. How is that possible? And then they actually go and see it and the homes were sold, sometimes even more per square foot they're sold. And so it's a way to um, uh, give people within a community an example that they can latch on to. I throw a couple out there, Harmony, Florida, Madera, Florida, Woodlands at Davidson in North Carolina. If you want to see these examples, there's the website you can take a look at and explore these different communities. However, once you do have these model developments, then don't let them sit there. Every chance you can, provide um, uh, these local examples for people to see with their own eyes. So have tours through there. I, I remember we've made inroads with other developers by taking more conventional developers to these com uh, green developments and showing how the different practices were implemented and designed and actual the monetary savings that they had. So for example, when they remove irrigation and turf grass and fill and grade on a lot, they can save up to $2,300 on the lots alone. And that adds up quite a bit if you add up all those lots within a large community. So um, what are some of the details on how one can create conservation developments? Like I threw out some of the ideas of the design, construction, and post-construction. And I'm just going to lead you. There's a lot of details to this, uh, all the way down to plant selection. And not having time to do this, there is um, uh, uh, a course out there online. Uh, you can uh, go to this website here, and um, it comes with a, a 100, and, I think, a 128-page 
manual that you can download, and you actually can get uh, approved credits, uh, continuing education credits uh, through landscape or uh, through architecture, uh, et cetera, uh, to help with your professional licensing. What does the course cover? Well, it, it, it not only just covers a little bit what I just discussed, but much more in depth in terms of looking at the design, construction, and post-construction uh, phases within a community. Um, so, in summary, we're at 137 here. Yeah, I did right in about 40 minutes. Um, think about uh, in terms of creating conservation developments, uh, you have to address decisions by citizens, developers, and policymakers. A lot of times we'll leave one of those out of the equation, typically uh, the people that move into a community, and we forget that even the best design can fail over time if people are not engaged, particularly with biodiversity. I've seen so many quote unquote green developments fail over time because people will set up feral cat colonies or they'll uh, ha have ATV vehicles running through the natural areas. There's no management, there's no uh, uh, thought into how we can engage with the residents when they live in these conservation uh, communities. Um, so design is not enough. You have to address construction and post-construction phases and to learn more about uh, how to create a conservation development and incorporate different and novel practices, there is that uh, online course that's available. I'll leave you with my, well, I'm not going to leave yet, but <laughs> my last slide is on uh, to learn more about PREC. You can go to this website, billgreen.ufl.edu, and, and that is my email. I'm happy now to entertain uh, questions, and if you have further questions, also email me as well. Thanks.